myself at a loss for words and the funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to Finding myself in the midst of you Beyond the music, beyond the noise All that I need is to be with you And in the quiet, hear your voice Word of God speak Tell you what, when you sit up here in the front and you look out at you all, you get all kinds of expressions, and sometimes particular ones, you'll, they'll catch your eye. And Isaiah's caught mine a little while ago, watching his dad as he's singing, and God only knows the impact that he makes on him. But Jeff, you did a great job this morning. He's pastor of the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Cold Spring, Kentucky. Come right on preach to us, Jeff. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, if I had to choose a service that I'd come to, it wouldn't be tonight. I, I would choose tomorrow night. <laughs> you know, Monday night, not all folks are in church, and uh, there's other people maybe that would be encouraged by the Word of God. And, and I'll be honest with you, man, the singing and the choir, if you don't invite them for anything else, invite folks to come and to hear how that this church lifts up the Lord God Almighty in a special way. Uh, thank you so much, choir. Thank you so much, congregation. Thank you so much for that song tonight. Uh, I, I really pray that God does speak through the Word of God. And that's the way that He does speak. We're thankful for that. Just a couple of things really quick before we uh, begin the message in Psalms chapter uh, 30 tonight. I want to get these things out of the way. First of all, I want to thank Ryan Laddermilk uh, for his prayer. But also, uh, he saved my life about a year ago, I believe it was. We were coming back from vacation and uh, traveled all the way from Florida, all the way to Cincinnati. And the only place I've had a ticket in a long time uh, was right about the Rockcastle County, Madison County line. Right this side of Rockcastle County, I was in a work zone and I was speeding and I told the officer I said I'm very sorry I teach my kids to respect you it didn't work he still gave me the ticket and uh, so I paid I, I paid what the paper said it was about fifty seven dollars or something like that but I didn't pay the court cost and the reason I didn't was uh, I mailed it in I didn't think I needed to pay that and I got a call from state trooper Ryan Loudermilk he said, Preacher, said, uh, man, I know you, and uh, you owe money, and there's a bench warrant out for your arrest. 
every bit of life left my body. <laughs> and uh, we got that thing straightened out, and I appreciate what he had done for me. And uh, I'm glad to see my cousin Gary here as well. And I know you guys have been praying for him after the accident up in Wisconsin. And you guys heard about the accident, right? No? He was uh, riding a horse and uh, fell off. And the horse drug him, and his foot was stuck in the stirrup. And thank the Lord for the Walmart greeter. It said, unplug the horse, son, unplug the horse. And he's okay, and uh, glad to see him here tonight. I'm so glad he's not called to preach and can't get up after me, amen? <laughs> but if you've got your Bibles tonight, go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms, chapter number 30. And I want to draw your attention, if I can, to verse number 9 in Psalms, chapter 30. Something very interesting that David makes a statement here in Scripture and uh, I was reading through this, uh, the book of Psalms in my devotional time. And I'd read through Psalms 30 many, many times. And it seemed like when I was going through Psalms chapter 30, my heart, my attention was always kind of on verse number 5. For his anger endureth but for a moment, and in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Because it's such a, a familiar and kind of a famous verse, my attention was always drawn to that. But as reading through verse 9, I want you, if you don't mind, to stand in respect for the Word of God as we read this. I want you to see kind of an analogy of what David makes about his life in this particular verse. A very poignant question that he asks, and I, I want to ask the same of us tonight. David says to God, he says, What profit is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Here's the thought. David's asking God or making a statement in a question form to God, am I better off dead or am I better off alive? Am I better off dead or am I alive? And tonight the question I want to ring in your hearts when it comes to the question of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. In God's army, are you better off dead or are you better off alive? Dearly Father, we thank you for this time and we thank you so much for your word. And as our dear brother sang tonight, uh, it, it speaks to us. It speaks to us in volumes. And so many times, Lord, when I'm reading through your word, it's so funny to me how that you convict me. And I sometimes think that, Lord, you wrote the Bible just for me. And I know that everybody that has their devotions and everybody that reads through the Bible thinks probably the very same thing. And how that when we're reading it, it seems like the book we're involved in, that's our favorite book at the time because you speak to us so well. So God, tonight, I understand that your word even says in and of itself that it does not return void. So God, you speak tonight, not me, but you speak through your word. And Lord, my prayer is very clearly, again, as I prayed this morning, and I've prayed so many times in my ministry, if there's anyone here tonight that does not know Jesus Christ, uh, what a glorious night for them to trust your son and have a personal relationship with him tonight. Would you cause that to happen? Would you convict hearts and help them to call upon the name of Jesus Christ? But those, Lord, that know us, and this message, Lord, uh, by the psalmist, by David, is really geared to us that do know you. And God, as we weigh out our lives, and, and Lord, I'm not going to be hypocritical because tonight I need to assess my life. And as I look at my life, God, help me to weigh it out and to see, am I better off dead or am I better off alive when it comes to your service? So you do your work, and God, help us to get out of the way. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's children said, Amen. and you may be seated. Are you better off dead or alive. You know, David wasn't the only one that felt this way. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 8. Paul, the apostle who wrote 13 books in the New Testament, of the 27, he wrote 13, who was a very influential man when it comes to Christianity. As a matter of fact, listen to me, your Christianity tonight, uh, because Paul went to the Gentiles, uh, you, must be you must be very thankful for the Apostle Paul as he took the gospel from Jerusalem out into the Gentiles. The Bible said to the Jews first, but also to the Greeks, and that's us as Gentiles. Notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, Paul speaking about his own trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, now notice this, in so much that we despaired even of life. 
Paul thought in his heart, I am even despaired of life. Am I better off dead than I am alive? You know the statement that Paul made. He said, I'm in a strait between the two. I, I long to go on home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, but I know it's more needful that I stay with you and minister. And the, the gospel is given out to the Gentile nation. So I'm stuck between this two. But in this particular point, he makes the statement, I even despaired of my life and long to be dead. We live in a day and time where the church, now listen to me, and I do have the opportunity to preach in a lot of different churches and uh, involved in a lot of different ministries. We live in a very entertainment-based church age. Not far from where we minister, a place is called Crossroads Community Church. And I do not pick on churches and preach on a lot of churches in a lot of senses, but on the fourth Friday of every month, we go to Over the Rhine in Cincinnati. If you're not familiar with that area, it's a very crime-ridden area. About, uh, they average about 57 deaths a year, uh, most of them drug-related. It's a very rough area. And we go there every fourth Friday, and we preach there. And while we're there, Crossroads Community Church serves the food. Now, our church runs about 200. Crossroads runs about 5,000. And so while we were there one particular evening... I preached a particular message on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, about 20 men trusted the Lord as their personal Savior. And so we went for the meal downstairs afterwards. Uh, the workers from my church would sit at different tables and they would share the gospel with each individual there. Uh, at one particular table, a young lady by the name of Alyssa White began to share the gospel. There were four homeless men there and two workers from Crossroads Baptist Church. As she shared the gospel, she didn't want to make the homeless people feel like that she was pointing the gospel just in their direction. So she started with the individual from Crossroads Community Church just to her left, worked her way around the table with each individual, and ended with the other individual from Crossroads uh, Community Church on her right. At the end of the night, there were two of those individuals that got saved. None of them whom were homeless. The two individuals both said to Alyssa, we have never heard what the preacher preached upstairs. And I just gave a very clear, simple gospel message. And they said, we've never heard what you have presented tonight. And because of this entertainment base, kind of a non-committal Christianity that's sweeping all across America where it's scratching your ears and patting you on the back, there are some ramifications that are coming into so-called Christianity in America. Here's one of the greatest things. There is no longer a fear or respect for God Almighty. I want to share something. I believe with all my heart that God can and will take your life if it's a necessity. The Bible is very clear. Listen to me. And I want to get right into the message. The Bible is very clear on our lives being very short and very brief. Psalms chapter 90 and verse number 12. The Bible says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Uh, Genesis chapter 47 verse 9 says, After living 130 years, Jacob said to Pharaoh, Few and evil are the days of my life. A after numbering his days, he made the statement, My days are few and evil. Job chapter 14 verse number 1, the Bible says, Man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. When he numbered his days, he said our days are few and full of trouble. Job made that statement. James chapter 4 and verse 14, I know you've heard this verse. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then it vanishes away. When he numbered his days, he said our days are few and then they are forgotten. Therefore, listen to me, we must make the most of our lives in the short time that God gives to us. We may live in a non-committal type of Christianity. We may live in an entertainment kind of a base Christianity. But listen to me, Bible Baptist Church. It's important that in this day and time, we make our lives count. When we count all things and we weigh out our lives, our lives when it comes to God Almighty, not to the world and not to the businesses and not even to our schools so much, but as unto, as unto God, our lives have got to count in these last days. By the way, everyone's life counts for something. Uh, it may be a testimony for someone or something, but everyone's life counts for something. When you think of different people, things come to your mind, and, and those things will stick in your mind because of the testimony of their life. You may be known as a hunter, as a fisherman, as someone that sows, as someone that sings, someone that teaches, someone that uh, works with real estate. Uh, whatever you're known by, you have a testimony for who you are. God's Word says that we're to love righteousness and we're to hate evil. There's only two choices, listen to me, when it comes to life, when it comes to making your life count. Listen to me, according to the Word of God, there's only two choices. There's only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God 
or pleasing self. Unfortunately, there's no in between. You straddle the fence and you're thinking of yourselves. So I want to look at the two choices that David made here. Uh, speaking of choices, the two choices that David made. He said, am I better off dead or am I better off alive? In the first part of Psalms chapter 30, he shares with how that God brought him back from the grave. He says, God, you brought me even up from the pit. And so after making that assessment to God, he says, God, what shall it profit? Or is there profit in my blood if I go down to the grave? Am I better off dead or am I better off alive? Weigh out your life tonight. I have to weigh out my life as well as you do. And you may say, well, does God work that way anymore? Does God want me to weigh out my life? And, and is God saying to me it's important that I assess it? I think about uh, the handwriting on the wall and God's finger that wrote out and said, Meany, meany, tikal ufarsin, you have been weighed in the balances. Your life has been weighed out, king, and you have been found wanting. Yes, God wants you to assess your life. As a matter of fact, the Bible is very clear in the New Testament. He says, make your calling and election sure. He says, let a man examine himself, whether he be in the faith. It's an important part of your Christian walk that on a regular basis you make a checkup, sometimes from the neck up and sometimes from the neck down. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16, both speak on the subject of sin Unto death. You know, people ask the question all the time to me as a pastor. I don't know if you get these questions or not, Brother Staten, but they ask me on a regular basis, why does God allow so-and-so or this person or this young child or this baby or this loving father or this mother of small children, why does God allow them to die? Here's what I believe because I don't have all the answers. And, and, I, don't, and I don't even uh, pretend to have them. But I know this, that God will take fruit. And he takes fruit in two occasions. Number one, he will take fruit when it's ripe, or he'll take fruit when it's rotten. Not too far from here, I'll be honest with you, I had a cousin by the name of Joey Hansel. Joey surrendered into the ministry, and uh, Joey was following after the Lord, and it wasn't long after that he was stricken with cancer of the lymph nodes. He was a young man, he was about 32 years of age, and I remember when we got the report that he was sick, uh, it, it was heart-rendering, and and I wondered, even to myself, at the time I was a, a preacher, and I wondered, God, why Joey? Joey had lived his life for himself for uh, such a long time. He had gotten saved, and then he committed his life to follow after you and, and Bible college and preaching. And now this happens, God. I remember traveling down to Northside Baptist Church when it used to be down there by the hospital, and I heard him preach his last message. And he preached with all of his heart, and he was weak, and he was frail. And, and the whole time he was preaching, I remember thinking, Lord, it'd be great if he just hung around a little longer and kept preaching like that. He preached from the very depths of his heart. And I remember that service. A young lady stepped out of the aisle and she came forward and she accepted Christ as her personal Savior. And I thought, man, Lord, many, many people could be saved. And, and I was thinking on selfish terms. And it wasn't long after that I was at work. And a phone call came and my mom said, Jeff, Joey is gone. Two little girls, a wife, a preacher, and he's gone. The only thing that ran through my mind was, Lord, I hope the fruit was ripe. I, I hope that the task that you had for him was accomplished. And therefore, Lord, that's why you took him. Look at the life of Elijah. In the Old Testament, Elijah first appears on the scene and he sticks his finger in Ahab's face and at the brook Cherith he's fed by the ravens and the brook dries up and he heads to Zarephath to the widow and her son and they're about to die. They've got one little curse of oil and just a little bit of meal and the preacher says to them, uh, feed me and if you'll feed me then you can eat what's left over. And she said, that's fine, we were going to eat this and just die. It's all that we have left. And God miraculously, every time she went into the meal after that because she fed God's man, God always caused there to be meal and the oil never ran dry and the widow and her son uh, received a blessing because of his ministry. Then the boy dies and, and the, prop, uh, the preacher Elijah revives her. And then Mount Carmel occurs where he stands in the face of the preachers of Baal and, and God calls down, he calls down fire from heaven and it licks up the uh, sacrifice, the rocks, the stone and the water and he, he causes it to stop raining and and then the rain comes, and man, what a great preacher Elijah was. He's standing on a mountaintop, and he's a bit discouraged, and God shows him a great wind, and God says, I'm not in the wind. He shows him an earthquake, and man, what a, uh, what a close relationship he had with God, and, and, and he shows him fire, and he says, I'm not in the wind, and I'm not in the earthquake, and, and I'm not in the fire. But the still, small voice 
And so God had this intimate walk in a still small voice with Elijah. And he had this whirlwind ministry. And then at the end, God takes him up in a chariot of fire. Surely Israel would have said, uh, Lord, leave Elijah. Uh, isn't Israel better off? We had Ahab and Jezebel and he stuck his fist in his face and he showed God how mighty you were. Don't take Elijah from us. But Elijah was better off dead than he was alive. In God's service and in God's army, when all maybe have wanted him to stay and, and we need him and he's a, a great man of God, God knew that the whole time a young preacher by the name of Elisha was standing in the shadows watching what he was doing in his life. And God said, your time is up, Elijah. Your fruit is ripe. Your mission is accomplished. I now want to work through Elijah. You know what? Elijah never complained when he went to heaven. But he was better off dead to God that he was alive. I was a youth pastor in a place called Socialville, Ohio. Probably the first official work that I ever had. And by the way, official works don't really amount to much of anything. I'd been a youth pastor for about seven years when a church called me to be the youth minister. We went there, we started a bus ministry, and I worked with the young people. I, I worked with the teenagers. And while I was there, there was a young man by the name of Brian Rowe that was in my youth group. And Brian was the kind of kid that, as a youth leader, I was kind of drawn to. When I came into the Sunday school class, I only had about six kids when we came. It soon grew to about 45. But he always sat back in the back. I don't know if you've ever seen these kind of teenagers, but he would put his knees up on the seat in front of him. He'd put his arms across his chest and he'd put his head down. And so I thought, well, this kid's a challenge. That's the kind of kid I like. And I thought, I'm going to make friends with this kid. So I'd aggravate him. He had a blonde haircut at the time the bowl haircut was in. And I was starting to lose my hair. I know that's hard to believe, but... Uh, I used to make fun of his hair, and it wasn't long till uh, we were pretty good friends. And Brian started to move up in the youth group as far as seats are concerned, and he was sitting on the front row uh, not much longer after that. And Brian was a good kid, and, and Brian just needed some mentoring and tutoring because, listen to me, he came to church every Sunday with one person, and one person only. That was his mom, Sandy Rowe. You see, Brian's dad was lost. Brian had two older brothers that were both lost. And they used to watch football and say bye and make fun of Brian as he went with his mom to church. And therefore, when he came to church, that's why he sat back in the back with the attitude. He thought, I'm coming because I love mom. And my brothers and my dad make fun of me. So he had a bad attitude. Well, God began to change him. The whole time Brian's come, and listen to me, Sandy Rowe, his mother, would sing in the choir. And man, she had a beautiful voice, but listen to me, that's not what I remember the most about her. She'd be singing in the choir, there would come some words about rescue the perishing or those that are lost, and she would slip out of the choir in the midst of the song, come to the front of the church, and down on her knees, she would weep out to God. You know, there's not one person in that church in Socialville, Ohio, at Socialville Baptist Church, did not know what Sandy was praying about. Oh, we couldn't hear her audibly, but we knew she was praying for her husband and for her two sons that were lost. And she would pray and she would weep and beg God. And I remember ladies in the midst of the choir special would come and pray with Sandy because they realized the burden that she had. And the whole time, Brian is watching as his mom would pray. This went on for quite a long time. And then I remember we had a revival. A speaker came in from North Carolina. And he was preaching on having a burden for your family. And having a burden for those that you work with. And those that you go to school with. But the only thing that stuck out in Sandy's mind is, God, I need a greater burden for my husband and for my sons. She came to the altar. She always had, but she prayed something she had never prayed in her life. She said, God, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes for my husband and my two sons to be saved. That's what I'm willing, God, for you to do. She uttered that prayer. Several people heard that. And boy, she had a new commitment, a new uh, vitality of about praying for her husband. She went home and shared the gospel with her husband. She shared the gospel with her two sons. They told her, Mom, honey, it's not for us. That's for you and Brian but not for us. I was preaching a youth revival down in Lexington, and I invited my kids. And for the first time in my ministry, for the first time in my ministry, God laid a person on my heart. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I don't want you guys to think that I'm weird. But as I prepared the message, I thought about Brian Rowe. I was preaching on the prodigal son. I said to the Lord, and I don't know if you guys do this, but I'm talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, he comes to church. Uh, why would you want me to preach a message on the prodigal son about Brian Rowe? So I said, Brian, are you coming to Lexington with the youth group? Yes, preacher, I'll be there. Brian, uh, are you going to sit up close by us with, with the youth group? Yes, I'm going to be right there, preacher. And I went up to the parking lot, got there with the van. There was about 15 to 20 kids there, except for Brian Rowe. Brian didn't go. Man, I drove all the way to Lexington with the burden. I said, Lord, you know what? You gave me this message for Brian. And 
He's not here. We got to Lexington to preach the message. There was about 200 kids there, and about 47 kids came forward. Several of them were saved, and several kids uh, had rededicated their life. And the whole time I thought, Lord, maybe I should take a tape to Brian. I went home. I worked third shift, so I had to go home and go immediately to the third shift that night. One of my young people called me and said, Preacher, with a scream like I've never heard, Brian is dead. I said, What? Brian Rowe is dead, screaming and crying. I'm at work. I'm tore up, and I'm like, God, what happened? Why did you lay that message in my heart? And now he's in eternity. Come to find out that Brian was riding his skateboard. He'd completely forgotten about the meeting. His mom had completely forgotten about the meeting, and he was riding his skateboard. He was in a gravelly part of the road, so he bent down to get his skateboard. When he did, there was a fellow in a truck coming this way who reached over to the passenger side floorboard to get something off the floorboard. When he did, the steering wheel followed suit. When he looked up, Brian stood up and he hit him head on. He crushed his chest and crushed his heart. He was dead instantly. The kids, every kid in the youth group, I'm pretty sure almost every kid called me, weeping and crying, Brian's gone. Brian's dead, preacher. What are we going to do? And, and I went to the funeral home, and I remember the sight. It's very vivid in my mind. I walked to the back of the funeral home, and there were kids that were standing there that I'd never seen in my life. And they said, you're Brian's preacher. You're Brian's preacher. I said, no, I'm his youth pastor. Oh, you're his preacher. We know all about you. Can you tell us what happened to Brian? And I was able at the funeral, room, uh, funeral home to be able to share what had happened with Brian. And I started with the fact that he had trusted Christ as his personal Savior. And that, yes, he suffered a tragedy, but now he was in, in eternity and God was taking care of him. I was able to share with a room full of kids who were holding the trucks from his skateboard. One young lady was holding his T-shirt. His mom had his sweatshirt and Sandy kept smelling it and crying. And I was able to share the gospel right there in the funeral home. And kids were, listen to me, kids were convinced. Converted in a funeral home. You know why? Because Brian Rowe was better off dead than he was alive. But the story doesn't end there. You see, it wasn't too many days later on, we had the funeral service at church. Sitting on the front row was Sandy Rowe, her husband, and Brian's two older brothers. My pastor preached a message that day. It was a powerful message with a broken heart and tears in his eyes and tears streamed down his face. Not a dry eye in the house. And uh, they had everyone dismissed to go to the graveside. And they closed the casket. And I remember Sandy crying and her husband and her sons were trying to console her. And, and she wouldn't have it. She just kept saying, not Brian. Brian was the only one, God, that came to church with me. Brian's the only one that loved his mom enough to trust Jesus. And she had nothing to do with the dad and the Two brothers. They took the casket out by the graveside, set up under the tent. There were so many young people and, and so many people there. I, I couldn't even hear as my pastor shared the words by the graveside there. When he was done and they began to sing, Sandy draped herself across the casket. I can still see her. She draped and the casket was rocking and people were afraid. So people came and steadied the casket and steadied her. And I remember her husband came and he draped over Sandy's back. And the two boys came and, and she was very matter of fact. And she rose up and she pointed her finger and she was saying things that I could not hear. And then I saw her motion for her pastor and, and the preacher came over and he put his arms around both of them. And I, I saw all three of them go to their knees in prayer. It wasn't long till he stood up and he looked the boys in the face and he began to share. I didn't know at the time, but he began to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And both those boys and the pastor went to their knees. And that day, at Brian's graveside, his dad and his two brothers accepted Christ as their personal Savior. It wasn't long after that, every service, the dad, the two brothers, and the mom sat on the front row of every service. They had brand new Bibles because they'd never had a need for one before. And they brought them to church, and they were saved, and their lives were changed because Sandy Rowe prayed, God, whatever it takes, and listen to me, whatever it took was the fact that Brian was more profitable dead than he was alive. Do you know what you do affects other people? Your life can affect the lives of other people. Brian was not sad, but Sandy was sad. She's since written a book about the whole affair. And it shares the very same story I shared with you tonight. Because Brian Rowe was more effective dead than he was alive. Tonight, are you more effective dead 
are alive when it comes to the service of God Almighty. The Bible shares with us not only a story of Elijah, who was more profitable God because his fruit was ripe. It also shares with us a story of Samson. And you know the story of Samson, but listen to me. Samson was more profitable God dead because his fruit was not ripe, but his fruit was rotten. We know the story of how that he killed a lion with his bare hands and he slew 30 men who had tricked his wife out of a riddle and he, he took their garments and he paid back a debt, a bet that he had made on a riddle after killing the lion. The bees had built the hive inside there. The Bible tells us that he killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Have you ever thought about that? I don't know how you do your devotions. I, I'm not very, uh, I, I'm weird. Anybody already picked up on that? I, when I read through that, when I was a kid and son, you, you know that? I hope your hair turns out just like mine. <laughs> Here's what I think. Growing up in Sunday school, I always had the picture, the flannel graph picture of Samson. He's pushing the grist mill. Have you ever seen that picture? Muscles bulging. His eyebrows have muscles. That's not what Samson looked like. Samson was a little bitty puny guy about the size of Gary Fain. Little bitty. Gary's not puny. Gary's one of the strongest guys I know. But he was a thin guy. Here's why I believe that. Here's what I base that uh, summation on. There's a thousand men that come against Samson. He's got the jawbone of an ass. He kills 900, let's say 97. There's three guys left. There are 997 men piled up on both sides of it. What were the last three guys thinking? If he was a big, strong guy like Hulk Hogan, I'd think, let's run. But if he was a little scrawny guy, well, maybe I can take him. And so he slays a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Because the Bible says the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Not because of his size and not because of his strength, but because of the Lord. He caught 300 foxes and he tied their tails together and put a firebrand and set them loose in the corn to burn the corns. It's the first reference in the Bible, by the way, to taillights. And, and they ran through the corn. But what kind of a guy catches 300 foxes? I mean, this guy had the spirit of the Lord. He picked up the great city gates of the Philistines. By the way, that's the Palestinians. They've been causing God's people trouble for many, many years and still are. So he grabbed the Philistine gate and they, he carried it up to the top of the hill, these gates. And all the men couldn't get him back down, but one guy carries him up because the Spirit of the Lord was on him. And then he meets Delilah. He always had his eye in the wrong place when he first sought that woman in Timnath. His parents said, isn't there a woman among all of Israel and, and you go after this daughter, Timnath? Can I say something just for free young people? Listen to me. A world of heartache when you date a lost person. A world of heartache when you set your sights on someone who is not a child of God. I grew up in the preaching that I heard. This is all free. Uh, I'm chasing a rabbit, but I want you to hear this. Uh, I grew up my whole life hearing the message that don't marry a lost person because if you do, you'll have hell in your home and the devil for a father-in-law. It's not the worst scenario. It's not the worst scenario. Here's the worst scenario. You meet someone that's lost. You're saved. That person's a wonderful mate. You have a wonderful life together. You have children and grandchildren together. And, and, and things work out wonderfully. And you grow old together. And you love that person with all of your heart. And then you die. And you spend eternity with Christ. And they spend eternity in hell. That's the worst scenario. And so... Samson is not concerned about eternity. Samson is not concerned about what the Lord wants for his life. Samson is not even concerned about delivering Israel. He's interested in his own desires. And he sees Delilah. And you know the story of Delilah. Uh, she causes him to lie with her. And, and she asks him, Samson, wherein is your great power? And I know that the Bible says the Philistines bribed her. But it didn't take much for her to be able to say, yeah, I'll, I'll ask Samson. He didn't mean anything to her. And so she says, what's the story? secret of your strength and so he tells kind of a fib he, he outright lies and says to her well if you were to tie my hands with new ropes and so while he's sleeping she ties him up and the philistines come in she says the philistines are upon you and he breaks them like they're nothing and slays the philistines and she cries oh you lied samson you've broken my little heart what's the secret of your strength samson he says, well, if you take my seven locks, and he's getting close to the truth, and, he, and you weave them in a weaver's beam, uh, uh, in, in the weave, and, and then I'll be as other men. And she does what he says. He falls asleep, and the Philistines come in. She says, the Philistines be upon you. And he 
shakes his head and breaks the weaver's uh, beam and slays the Philistines. And then finally, after much torment and crying, she says, what's the secret, Samson? He said, if you shave my head, it was the last of his Nazarite vow to be broken. He touched a body and touched that was from a grape and now his hair was shorn. She shaves his head and the Bible says and shares one of the saddest passages in the Bible. He knew not that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. The Philistines came upon him and his life was never the same. You know the story. And listen to me. This is actually how it happened with Samson. They took, two hot, they took an iron, a hot iron, and they heated it up in the fire. And they placed it on the inside of his eyeball. The Philistines were notorious for this. And as they gouged his eye out, the poker seared the rest of it shut, cauterized his eyes. He was blind. No hope of ever seeing again. They shaved his head, and then they caused him to grind corn. And he did not push like an oxen a great gristmill. In the days of the Philistines, the only people that ground corn were grandmas. And grandmas would sit with their robes, with their legs crossed, around in the dust of the city square. They would take their laps and open up their skirts and put corn inside that. Then they would take a stone that had been worn out from grinding the corn, and a thing called a pestle, and they would put the corn inside there, and they would grind it. So here's the strongest man in Israel doing a grandma job. That's why they would come by and make sport of him. That's why they would come by and make fun of him. Here's Samson, God's deliverer for the nation of Israel, who's grinding corn. He is blinded, he is grinded, and he is bound to the Philistines because he set his sights in the wrong place. The last part of his life, they're going to make fun of him. They decide to have sport with Samson. They take him down to the temple. And while he's there, he's blind, he asks a young lad, he says, can you show me the pillars that hold this great building up? They estimate about 10,000 Philistines were inside that building. And so he finds his way to the pillars and he says to God, he says, God, use me just one more time in a paraphrased edition. He takes those pillars and he pushes them apart. And in his death, more Philistines are killed than any other time in his life. Do you know why? Listen to me. Samson was more profitable dead than he was alive. He was more profitable dead than he was alive. The last thing I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to be done. I was a pastor down in Barry, Kentucky. And there was only 250 people in the town. And so you had an opportunity really to witness to everybody there. We knocked on every door probably eight, nine times in the six uh, years we were there. And the first night I was in Barry. They had called me and asked me to fill in to preach. And I was working on the railroad at the time down in uh, Danville, Kentucky. I was working at the Toyota yard. And so driving back from Danville, I decided to get off of 27 and go to Barry. If you've ever been to Barry, Kentucky, you don't just get off 27 and go to Barry. I drove through the night. It was raining. It was a miserable night. I had my rain uniform on uh, that I'd wore on the railroad. And I got to the church. And it looked like a Mrs. Paul's fisherman kind of an outfit, the hat and the coat. And I, and I got out and I saw the little bitty country church. And man, I, I'll never forget that night. I thought, oh no, Lord, I always wanted to go to Philadelphia. I always wanted to go inner city Chicago, work with drug dealers. And, you know, I had these aspirations for my ministry, Brother State. And I thought, Barry, Kentucky. I remember it was raining and I got down on my knees in front of that little church. And I said, Lord, if this is where you'd have me to be, I'll serve you the best before I can finish the prayer, a truck drives by. Guy rolls down the window. He's obviously drunk. Hey, buddy, are you nuts? It's raining. I look around. The guy's name is Ricky Fryman. I didn't know at the time. Big guy. You, do you, did you preach on TV today? That was you, wasn't it? It's a good message. Don't drive while you're a policeman right over here, buddy. He's about as big as this guy. So it's hard not to miss Ricky Fryman. Well, to make a long story short, his family came to church. His little brother Ricky, uh, his little brother Mike got saved, Mike Fryman. His mom and dad started coming to church. His grandma and his grandpa and his uncles, they all came to church except for Ricky. Ricky's the first guy I met in Barry. They all came and they'd, uh, Mike had gotten saved. Different ones in the family. Gary had gotten saved. And, and, and so they began to fill one section of my church right back in the back corner. And they said to me, man, let's pray for Ricky, preacher. Let's pray and ask God to save Ricky. And, and God can save Ricky. And I said, well, we'll do that. And we started praying for Ricky. And if you're praying for somebody, and then you see him in town, it's hard not to share the gospel. Uh, can you come here? Come here. I see Ricky in town. And I'm a big guy. I'm a little bit bigger than this fellow. <laughs> and so I say to him, I say, hey, Ricky. 
You're not afraid of anything, are you? He wasn't smiling. And he gets really close to me. Yeah, I was looking up his nose, too. And he says to me, what do you need, preacher? I said, you're not afraid of nothing except my church. Now, listen to me. I'm not a brave guy. But when you're witnessing, God gives you kind of a special power. You think, well, the Lord's on my side. Yeah, but he might still crush me anyway. And so I'm sharing with him. And I I said, Ricky, you're scared to death to come to my church. No, I'm not, preacher. I just don't want to, he says to me. You can sit down now. They get the point, I'm sure. (laughs) And so he said, uh, I'm not coming to church. He said, matter of fact, said, this is November the 8th. Said, this is deer season. Listen to me. Ricky Fryman probably ran over more deer than I ever saw in my life. He was an avid deer hunter. He said, I hunt every opening Saturday, and I I hunt every opening Sunday. He said, I kill deer every Saturday and every Sunday. I have since I started hunting many, many years ago. I said, all right, Ricky. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to pray you don't kill a deer this weekend. I remember his laugh when I said that. Ha, 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 ha. Not kill a deer? You don't know who I am, do you? I said, no, maybe not, but I know who God is. And so I prayed, and I actually prayed, God, help him not even to see a deer. Help him not to kill a deer, Lord, if he will come to know you as your personal Savior. I prayed that Friday night. I prayed that Saturday morning uh, while I was hunting, and and I prayed that Saturday night. And then Sunday morning when I was in church, I prayed that, not openly, but I prayed that to the Lord. Didn't see Ricky until Monday morning at my house. He knocked on my door, and he was really close to the glass door, and I could see him through there, and he was trying to see me in the house. I thought, well, maybe if I go out the back door, I can drive away before he gets a hold of me. But I went to the door, and I opened up the door, and he said, how dare you pray that way, preacher? I said, pray what way, Ricky, that you wouldn't kill a deer? He said, I didn't even see one. I said, really? I said, you should have been in church. I said, "Uh, God had a message for you Sunday there at church. We had that re- uh, revival, our fall revival, not long after that. And guess who came? We had a, a special service at the end of the week. And uh, some of you, a lot of my family have been there. Be one of so many. And it was a particular service. It was be one of 250. And we were so excited because there were only 250 people in the whole town of Barrie. And we wanted to get 250 people inside a building that really held about 100 people packed in. And so that day, we had prayed, God save someone. God, you do a work. Do you know that God had saved many, many people in those services we had before, but only one guy got saved that day? <laughs> his name was Ricky Fryman. Ricky was sitting with his family, and I remember we gave the invitation. He stood up, and man, when he stood up, he was a big guy. And he came down the aisle, and, and uh, I'll never forget, he grabbed me by the hand. His big hand wrapped all the way around my hand. He said, Preacher, I need to be saved. I said, Yeah, you do, Ricky. You need the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. We got down. I was uh, down on my knees. He was as tall as me on his knees as I was standing up. And we got down and we prayed and he got gloriously born again. But the story doesn't end there. Ricky said to me, preacher, now that I'm saved, he said, I don't need to come to church. I said, oh, no, no, Ricky. Now you need church. Church wouldn't do you any good before. Now you need church more than the church needs you. And we need you here, Ricky. No, no, preacher, man, I'm going to heaven. I got Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. I don't got to come to church. And he never did. Never did come. That spring down at Robinson, there's a dam. And every year when it floods, the fish start to run. Ricky was not only a great hunter, he was a great fisherman. He was 24 years old. He walked out on the dam and he was fishing. All of his buddies were there and they were drinking. And Ricky didn't drink anymore. They noticed that. And Ricky didn't party like he used to, but he loved to hang around with those guys. He was showing off for some girls and some guys, and he got out there, and the water caught him, pulled him over the dam. He was caught in the eddy just underneath the dam, and they said he came up three times, and every time he came up, he screamed, Oh, God, somebody help me. Oh, God, please, somebody help me. The third time, he disappeared under the muddy water. There was a knock came on my door, and it wasn't Ricky. It was Yanni, his dad. Tears in his eyes, he said, Preacher said, Ricky's fallen into the river, and we can't find him. Would you pray that he swam ashore somewhere and we can find him? I said, I sure will. His little brother Mike said, Preacher said, if you don't mind, if you'll stand at the Barry Bridge and kind of watch and see if Ricky floats or swims by. I remember I went down and I took my spotlight from my truck and I was standing on the bridge and the whole time I'm praying, oh, Lord, I don't want to find him. Oh, God, please, I don't want to find Ricky. Help him be on shore somewhere. God, please help him be on shore somewhere. I don't want to find Ricky Fryman. I stood there for what seemed like an eternity and 
Ricky never came by. His dad drove up and he said, Preacher, they found him. Got in the truck with him and drove. I left my truck right there on the bridge and we drove. And I remember we, like maniacs, drove through the middle of a tobacco field. And we got over to the edge of the shore and there lay Ricky and he was completely naked. The waves had beaten his clothes off of him. His mouth was agape. His arms were stiff. And they couldn't pull him out until the coroner got there. And Yanni kept begging, please pull Ricky out of the water. Can you guys, I, I know you guys. And he was calling them off by name. He knew the guys from Cynthiana. He said, come on, guys, can you just put him on the shore? The coroner got there and said, fellas, he's dead. Let's put him in the truck. And they put him up in the truck. And Yanni grabbed my hand, and I was trying to steady him. And I remember he stepped up into the truck, and I walked down the side of the truck, and he knelt down and took his handkerchief out of his pocket, and he wiped Ricky's face off. He said, Ricky's gone, preacher, and he pulled a leaf out of his mouth. I thought, Ricky's gone. He's dead. We preached his funeral, and I preached at a very cordial funeral. I don't know if you've ever done this, and, and I, I got sick in my stomach, Brother State, and I thought, man, I've been so formal, and I've not been very real today, and I, I, I hate that. I, I can't stand that. So we got to the gravesite, and I said, look, I said, usually I read First Thessalonians here, and I don't want to do that today. I'm going to tell you something. Hey, here's the story of Ricky Fryman. I shared the same story I told you tonight. How that Ricky had gotten saved and his life, uh, he had put his life in Christ, but he said he didn't want to be a part of the church and that he'd been saved. And I said to him, I said, listen to me, Ricky is not here today. I believe with all my heart because he sinned the sin unto death and he was harmful to the cause of Christ. And if you ever want to see Ricky again, you've got to trust Christ as your personal savior. And when you do, you've got to live for him. It's important that you live for God. And I gave an invitation at the graveside. I can't tell you how many of those uh, young people got down on their knees and asked Christ. How many of those guys and girls came to my church after that and their lives were changed? Do you know why? Because Ricky Fryman was better off dead than he was alive. You know, David, listen to me, and I want you to hear this. David's not saying that he's better off dead than he's alive. David's making the statement in Psalms chapter 30 that it is more profitable for him to be alive because will the dust praise thee? Will my blood from the pit raise up and praise you? No. He says, I'm better off alive. Tonight, I am not advocating suicide. I am not advocating your death. I shared every story and every biblical example in this passage because the obvious answer is we must serve God and be profitable to him more alive than we are dead. Do you understand that? There is a task that God has for each and every one of us. There was a book that swept this nation called The Purpose Driven Life. And people wanted that. And, and they read those devotionals. And they read that book. But listen to me. There's a principle there. God has a purpose for your life. And it will be fulfilled if you want. He'll use somebody else. Is your life more profitable dead than it is alive? The only challenge that you can receive from a message like this and from the scripture is, God, make me profitable. Make me profitable at Rock Castle County High School. Make me profitable at the job site where I work. Listen to me, it's not good enough that people know that you're just a Christian. It's important enough that you share your faith and that their lives can be transformed because of your life where you work where you recreate, wherever you go. Are you making a difference for God Almighty? Now listen to me, and I'm done. I promise Brother Staten is about to come for the, uh, for the invitation and invite you to make a change for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the shame. The truth of the Scripture has been preached. Not because I preach it. I, I, I don't ever think that. The truth of Scripture has been preached tonight. Some of you have been convicted because of what God's Word says. Here's what's bad. You'll hear God's Word, but you won't heed God's Word. You'll leave here unchanged. You'll know that God wants your life to be profitable. You know that God wants you to change and God wants you to be revived and God wants you to do more and yet you'll leave here unchanged because I have no idea what the excuse may be. Now, what will my family think? What will the preacher think? What will people think if I come forward and make a commitment to serve God better than I ever have? Who cares what anybody else thinks? Because what matters is what God thinks. Don't leave here. Listen to me. Don't leave here tonight without making a decision, a commitment to Christ. Do you have to come forward? No, you don't. But listen to me. If a decision needs to be made, make it tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Anyone tonight would say, Preacher, 
I'm not profitable to God at all. Do you know why? Because I don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not profitable to God because I, I'm not even his child. And you'd say, preacher, I don't care a bit if you pray for me. Is there anybody in the balcony or da- back in the back or down here downstairs that would say, listen to me, I'm not a Christian and it's not profitable because I'm not one of his. And would you pray for me, preacher? If I died right now, I don't even know where I'd spend eternity. Is there anyone like that say, that's me, preacher? Anyone at all with an uplifted hand? Secondly, you'd say, preacher, listen to me. I know this message was geared towards Christians. And I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. And I want to say this to you. I had a chance to pray for a lot of people in India. And they wanted just to touch my hand. And I used to say to them when I was in India, hey, my prayers are no better than yours. I do want to pray for you, but I understand that my prayers are no better than your prayers. But you say, preacher, I'm a Christian. And I've got to be honest with you. Right now, my life is more profitable dead than it is alive. If really I weighed out my life, I'm better off dead than I am alive. And you'd say, preacher, that's me. Would you lift your hand and say, that's me, preacher? I'm better off dead than I am alive. Thank you. Anyone else say, pray for me? Lastly, you'd say, preacher, I know that my life is not exactly where it needs to be. And I don't think I'm better off dead than I am alive, but I I know this. There are some things that I could do. There are some things that I could do to make my life better. And you say, preacher, that's me. And you'd lift your hand and say, that's me. Anybody at all. 